Good morning, everyone. Lovely, warm morning. Warm in our hearts. Let's start with prayer, remembering, I'm making noises, remembering that as I speak in the I am, I am speaking for you. God is, I am. God is living in, through, and as me, experiencing life through me. I joyfully celebrate this day, this morning, this place, the Center for Spiritual Living. I am so grateful that I am a part of this community that is transforming lives. I'm grateful for the love in my heart. I'm grateful that I am able to give generously of who and what I am, because with God there is no shortage, there is no shortfall. There is always, always enough. There is enough love, enough joy, enough hope right here in my heart, right here in this room. I'm so grateful that we have this opportunity to be together, and I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to live my life with God as my guide, as my coach, as my mentor. I am grateful that we continuously transform lives and make a world that is a wonderful place to live for each and every single person. I celebrate this day, and together we say, and so it is. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. As I am speaking on the subject of presence and what's lurking beneath the threshold of consciousness, in my couple of decades of research around happiness and how the brain operates, I know that the conscious mind is really only responsible for 4% four of our perceptions, what we see, our actions, what we do. 96% of how we show up in life is a product of our subconscious or the subjective mind. So what's lurking in yours? The power of presence. A few things have happened to me recently that have really increased my awareness and my intention or my attention to this idea of being present. Even right now, I know that some of you are thinking about what's going to happen after the service or what's going to be for supper or maybe about work tomorrow. How do I know that? Because I too have been there thinking those things. So even though my physical body is here, my mind is somewhere else. I am not present. Many of us have literally checked out. Would you agree? That we're going through life automatically, on autopilot. The first thing that happened to me, I was at Peter Hemingway Pool. Is anyone familiar with Peter Hemingway? Doesn't matter. I'd finished my swim. I'm in the ladies' change room, and within six minutes, no less than two men came into the ladies' change room. Do you think they were present? Maybe if they were standing there looking for ladies wrapped up in their towels, I'm not sure. These change rooms were clearly marked. There was huge signs everywhere, ladies room, men's room, there's signs on stands on the floor, there's signs on the walls, there's signs everywhere. What was different about this day is that once a month they reversed the change rooms. I guess so that they can do maintenance. Maybe they have, I know I've seen some uh, women electricians and such, but maybe whatever they were doing, they needed men, so they switched the change rooms. And there are signs everywhere, plastered over everything. So the couple of guys that came in, do you think they were conscious, present, and aware of their surroundings? They just automatically went into what would ordinarily be the men's change room. So other than the fact that I could have been caught naked, why is this a problem? If we're not present, to our lives. This is a huge, huge problem in my mind. What are we missing by not 
being present? What are we missing out on? What is God trying to show us that we can't see because we're not here, we're not present, we're in our own internal world? What are we missing? The second thing that happened to me, I'm out, I'm on Stony Plain Bridge, crossing over the top of Grote Road. I'm with my dog, so we're walking. And about 10 or 15 feet ahead of me is the city of Edmonton worker, and he's delightfully clearing the snow with the little blower machine ahead of me. So I'm like, the red carpet's being rolled out. This is great. Don't have to walk through the snow. It's all clear. We get almost to the end of the bridge when he turns around. He's got his blower. My dog and I are there. He's blowing snow all over us. We're covered in snow. It took probably, you know, time seems to be different when you're being covered in snow, but I'm going to say maybe 15 seconds before he actually realized we were standing there and he was covering us with snow. Now, I'm not sure where he was. I mean, his physical body was right there doing the job, but he clearly had not yet looked up to see that there was an actual pedestrian right there that he was now covering with snow. Not present. Maybe he was in Hawaii. Who knows? But he wasn't there. The third thing that happens, I'm in a hurry. Anyone here ever been in a hurry? How do things go when we're in a hurry? <laughs> Sometimes not well. Okay, we're renovating our kitchen. I'm at the tile store. We think we've chosen a tile. It's late Friday afternoon, but they only have a smidgen, like a little piece of tile on a big board. And I said, well, could I take a bigger one home to make sure it matches my counter? We don't have a bigger one, but I'll call the distributor, and you can go over there and pick it up. I'm standing right there when she's on the phone. She calls them. She gives them the tile name and the color. Now, I'm a little bit anxious, slightly pressed for time. I only have... 15 minutes to get to this distributor before they close Friday afternoon. I get there, and I'm in a hurry. I grab the tile, and I rush home. What happened? It's the wrong tile. Because I wasn't present enough to even look and see if the colors were in the vicinity of what we were looking for. If I had only looked, I would have noticed right away that it was completely the wrong color scheme. So not only was I not aware or present, the fellow or the person who pulled that piece of tile out was also not aware or present because he pulled the right kind of tile and the wrong color of tile. So I did not save any time because on Monday, I had to go back and get the correct tile to see if it would match the countertops we had chosen. Additionally, when I was in a hurry, has anyone been in a hurry driving their car? <laughs> well, I didn't get a ticket that day, but it just occurs to me how much time I gave away by not being present. Because when I was at the tile store, I was thinking about what I was going to make for supper. When I was making supper, do you think I was thinking about, oh, what am I going to wear to work tomorrow? Anyone here ever been maybe at the grocery store, but their thoughts are somewhere else? Or maybe I was out at an evening event and my mind was already going to have a nice hot bath after? How often are we disconnected from where we currently are? The idea of being present is so, so important. Can you identify with me how being present is so important? So what happens when we're unconscious, when we're not present or aware to our current life? Where do we go? In my version of life, we either go to the past or to the future. Two things happen, though. When we go to the past, we're usually remembering what we didn't prefer. We're remembering and recalling things that irritated us, upset us, made us angry. Would you agree? 
When we're in the past, we're living through that over and over. Or we go to the future. And that's where we get to do some great worrying. Would you agree about that? So we're either in the past, most likely focusing on negative events, or we're in the future worrying about what might possibly happen. So what's lurking beneath the threshold of consciousness is mostly repetitive garbage. It's the same thinking over and over and over. When I was a single parent for many years, I know I lived the same day slash years over and over and over because I didn't really set my intention for the future. It was more about survival, getting through this day. Get up, make breakfast, feed the kid, take to school, go to work, drive home, get to the shop. It just kept being the same day over and over. It wasn't even like Groundhog Day where he actually learned new things. <laughs> Mine really was like the same day over and over. Our lives become the sum total of our thinking. Yikes. Because for most of us, our thinking is not powerfully positive. Without our presence, our awareness, and our intention, life happens to us. Fear, doubt, and anxiety kidnap us. It's like getting in a car and the kidnapper is taking you where you don't want to go, but you have no choice. Or you're in a raft in the ocean and you're bobbing along with the waves, but there's no rudder, there's no steering wheel, there's no oar, there's nothing. You're just going where life takes you. Is this a familiar feeling for anyone? floating along the river or the ocean. Our everyday actions, worries, and thoughts generally do not command an exciting future. Predictable reality occurs. We base our future on the predictable reality that is our today. What we've experienced in the past up till this very moment predicts how we feel about the future. There's no surprises. We spend so much time ruminating over the past that it literally takes away our energy that we could be using to enjoy this present, to live this present, and to plan a delightful future. It is no wonder what was lurking in my subconscious mind was the belief that I was not smart enough, not good enough, and certainly I did not have whatever it would be to be successful or indeed anything other than mediocre to live a mediocre life. Let's look at the comments and the grades I found in my report cards. My mom kept all of my report cards. And I had the opportunity to review them recently. And it's no wonder that I did not believe in myself. It is no wonder that I turned to alcohol and drugs in junior high school to alleviate the pain and suffering I was already feeling about not being good enough. And certainly, there was no hope for me to have a powerful, positive future. This one is very interesting. I'm about 10 years old. And there's a section here, let me just find the right one, that says it's for, what did they call it? Performance. No, performance as an individual growing up in a democratic society. This pupil is learning to show self-confidence, assume responsibility, show a questioning mind, Think for himself while respecting the opinions of others. Not satisfactory. All of them are ticked off, areas in need of improvement. And I'm 10. There's comments on these report cards. Elizabeth continuously bothers those around her. If she would listen to directions, this would not be necessary. Three times I read in here, Elizabeth needs to grow up. I'm like 10. 
I am going to grow up, but could I be a child while I'm a child? Nope, you got to grow up. There's so many comments in here that says, well, here's one. If she grows up just a bit more and learns to think for herself, she will be a very good language arts student. Not a whole student, but at least in language arts, I could be good. I get to junior high. Things change a little bit. Let me get this one. We place in our culture and society a great deal of emphasis on grades. According to this, I should not be standing in front of you today. Language arts, 58. Social, 53. Math, 59. I'm really surprised. I thought that was my worst subject. Science, 53. Phys ed, 50. No wonder I never wanted to participate in any sports. I couldn't do it. I was already told in grade 8. Health and guidance, 40. Home ec, well, I knew I was going to be a failure as a parent and running my own house, 44. French, 36. Whatever my option was, I got a B minus. I don't know what that was. <laughs> then I get to high school. Now, grade 12 is the year that we put a lot of focus on because if you don't do well in grade 12, what happens? You're not going to university. Well, I already knew I wasn't going to university because my beliefs, the story that was operating my life, my unconscious operating system already told me I wasn't going to university. Final marks, grade 12, French, 50, social, 70. I don't know how I made that one. World geography, 60. Biology, 60. English, 60. French, 61. Typing, 9. <laughs> Do you think I ran right to university with these marks? I couldn't even apply for university with these marks, but I knew I couldn't go. I was destined for a life as a retail salesperson. I went you know, I started a job at a department store, and I stayed there for years because that's all I thought I could do. The programming, the operating system in my brain is created, well, your brain as well, it's created from every single experience that we have. All of those repetitious thoughts is creating our operating system, our beliefs, our stories. And we all have stories that either limit us or help us to expand. What's your story? What's lurking beneath the threshold of your consciousness? It's no wonder, again, that I turned to alcohol and drugs. The only friends I had were those outcasts who were also losers, that was the word, that weren't going to amount to anything. So why try? Why bother? That's the story of my life I repeatedly told myself. No point in even trying. In fact, some of the comments in here even said things like, Elizabeth needs to try harder, or Elizabeth needs to do this. Well, not much point, because I knew that my mental bubble wrap was already done, and I was a loser, and I would never be successful. Well. I managed to change things. I did manage to start overcoming, and I've subsequently created a platform and an actual program that helps lift people up. And in lifting myself up, I put specific systems into place, specific things that I could do. I developed a comprehensive step-by-step -step approach to creating a life I wanted. Now, when I first started university, do you think I believed that I could actually do it? No. And I believe this so firmly that I was unwilling to commit to being a full-time student, so it took me eight years to get a four-year degree. I could only do it bit by bit, step by step, but I did it. One of my clients was spending so much time thinking about, talking about, and sharing about a negative incident. Anyone here ever done that? Maybe not you. 
She was sharing about an incident that she was rightfully angry about. It happened six years ago. That's 72 months she was sharing this incident. Now, 72 months, I estimate a moderate estimate that she was sharing this story two times a week. So that's eight times a month, 576 times. That's one story that kept her stuck right where she was. Her brain literally experienced that event 576 times at a moderate estimate. The brain doesn't know the difference, or the subconscious doesn't know the difference between real and imagined. So every time we think about that incident that makes us so angry, righteously and rightfully angry, we're re-experiencing it over and over and over. Are we growing into the person we want to be? Not at all. During our time together, Janet learned how to be present, how to become aware of the automatic thinking that is running, how to become aware of the automatic thinking and the programs that were not serving her, and most importantly, how to create a compelling future. She has so much more energy now that her friends and her co-workers have literally commented on her changed state. Her physical state is different. Because when we're back in the past, we don't have the same energy to create a future that we want. That's why we're tired, stressed, and sometimes depressed. And that was only one incident that Janet had experienced. When we are constantly checked out from the present, we lose our capacity to live a life we love. Awareness is the first step in transformation. Becoming aware of our automatic responses, our automatic routines, our habits, our patterns, and releasing those negative patterns and habits that no longer serve us. Awareness is the first step. One of my clients was in her 30s with two children working as a legal assistant. The story she told herself, I'm not smart enough to become a lawyer. I have two children. How will I ever go back to school? What will my husband say? And the kicker, how will we manage financially if I go back to school? After becoming consciously aware of some of those limiting beliefs and the stories that she was telling herself, we worked to release them to free her of the shackles to help her become present. She is now a thriving lawyer earning more than she thought was possible, and living a life she thought was impossible. When I work with my clients, they transform because we get to the root of those problems. We pull them out and we replace them with what I prefer, a vision of the future. So we talked about the future. Now, most of us spend a lot of time worrying about the future. Do you agree? If you're like me, you may have some of these same worries. What if I get kidnapped by the mafia? <laughs> what if my child fails kindergarten and stays at home forever? What if London Bridge does fall down? What if little Miss Muffet falls off her tuffet? What if the sky really is falling? And thanks to Janet Jackson, I have a new worry. What if I get pregnant at 50? <laughs> the future is unwritten. Yet for most of us, we have taken the pages from the past and placed them into our future. Without pause, we just replicate our lives over and over and over, and unlike Groundhog Day, where he learns how to play the piano and becomes this stellar guy, my life was truly just the replication of the year before that and the year before that, and it just kept going. It wasn't particularly joyful or happy. Our best plan in the present is to continuously create this powerful vision for our lives, 
a vision of what we prefer, of how God can move through us, of how we can lift ourselves up to create that life we love. It's the stories that we tell ourselves that keep us stuck. We get stuck in what is or what was. Fighting against what is will never give us what we prefer. Let me say that again. Fighting against what is will never give us what we say we want. What is, is. What was, was. The future is still unwritten. It is not predicated on the past. That's why prayer and meditation are so helpful, because it brings us to this moment. It grounds us in this moment. Prayer and meditation help to connect us with source energy, Source is substance and supply. It is everything. And when we tap into that piece of us, there's that little piece of us that desires a more wonderful life, a better opportunity, more joy, more happiness, more love. When we tap into that in the present moment, we expand to what we believe. Our consciousness expands. And as our consciousness expands, our actions can start to become different. A daily prayer, a daily ritual, a daily practice, are they daily in your life? Making them a habit will change powerfully where you are going. Setting aside a few minutes each day to visualize Vision, living your greatest life possible. Instead of staying stuck in the worry about the future, you can visualize and vision an expanded idea of who and what you are, of who you can become. And I don't care how old you are or what your story is or was, you can change. That is the gift that we are given. With guidance, we can rewire our nervous system and reduce anxiety, reduce panic, reduce the shame. So many of us are just running on autopilot with all of these thoughts and stories. We don't stop to question them. We simply believe what is being generated, lurking beneath the threshold of consciousness. Each year does not have to be a reenactment of the past. You can make a conscious choice to shift out of that by simply acknowledging and becoming aware of what is in your subconscious, what's lurking in there. I really loved this. I found this in the Science of Mind, page 168. And it defines a practitioner. I spent years studying here to become a practitioner, and it helped me tremendously, and it helps me help others defines a practitioner as a professional, mental, and spiritual practitioner is one who has dedicated her life, her time, her energy, her intelligence to helping others through mental and spiritual means and methods. I love helping people discover what is possible to identify and get past their blocks and overcome their most stubborn obstacles. If you'd asked me when I was in high school, could I be the person standing in front of you today? Not a chance. There was no chance that I thought that. But using a brain-based, prayerful approach, we can literally rewire the system that's operating us. So adding new software. With God, all things are possible. We use treatment to clear the thought of negation, of doubt, and of fear to reveal the ever-powerful presence of God. Our intentions must be cultivated. This is why prayer, meditation, and coaching, again, are so powerful because they help lift us out of our story and into a future that's not only worry, fear, and doubt, but into a future that's filled with possibility and potential. And if I can do it, you can do it, because we are all one and the same. There is no difference between us, and my good is your good, and your good is my good. And as we collectively rise up and really discover 
who we want to be. We declare that. We become conscious of what's sabotaging us, what's holding us back. We open to this incredibly powerful opportunity to create a world that works for everyone as each individual shines. All of us are given the opportunity to shine. And the more we shine as individuals, the more we can help others and lift them up. And this is my joy in this moment. And my husband and I take presence so seriously that he even had it engraved on the top of his wedding band. Just that reminder every day to be present. We have rituals that keep us present in our relationship, in our marriage. Every morning, we make sure to have that couple of minutes of presence just with each other to acknowledge our love, our relationship, our life. At dinner time, in our family, we always stop and pray over that meal, over the day, being alive, celebrating life. It's a ritual. It's part of the fabric of who we are. We put down our phones because when we're on our phone, we're not being present to who and what is actually in front of us in that moment. We pause to be present at bedtime. How can you press pause and be present in your own life? Setting aside that time, remembering that thoughts create your actions, which create your beliefs, which continue to create your actions and your beliefs. So as you recognize your thoughts, you can start planting new seeds for the future. So I encourage you to find out what is lurking beneath the threshold of your consciousness. What would you prefer to shift into? We had the opportunity to watch Christopher Robin the other day, and I was so delighted, and this is such a great thing. He, Christopher Robin was asked by Winnie the Pooh, what day is it? And he said, it's today. And Winnie the Pooh says, it's my favorite day, because it's today. Thank you very much for being here. It has been my pleasure, and I wish you all the presence that is available right now.